Like David McKee, the animation team of Oliver Postgate and Peter Furman relished the creative freedom of working as an independent. In the 60s, they produced a string of successful shows, including The Clangers. They now had an idea for something even more ambitious. We used to go to the BBC for about once a year for a nice lunch and lots of praise. And what will you do next, boys? What, yes, <laughs> yes. And you would tell us what we're going to do next. And we would, I would, we would give them a sort of a quick rundown on what we were going to do next. And they would then chalk us in on, on next year's calendar, Peter and Oliver's film. A combination of music, illustrations and animations, Bagpuss was a real step forward for the Watch With Mother slot. But its cosy, sepia-tinted setting was a world away from the reality of Britain in the 70s. Not so long ago, there was a little girl, and her name was Emily. And she had a shop. The outside shots in the opening stills were filmed on the outside That's of right. this window. When Emily left the shop, Bagpuss and the other toys sprang to life. Bagpuss was um, a, a cat, basically a cat with visible thoughts. And, you know, in those, vis in, in those visible thoughts, thoughts bubbles, you could get all sorts of nice yeah. pictures. If you watch Bagpuss, he does very little moving. Most, mostly he's an observer sitting on his cushion. He had, uh, in his arms and legs, he had a skeleton, the same as all of them, so that he was able to be moved single frame by frame to whatever position he had to be, and he would stay there. He, this, he hasn't got any skeleton in at the moment because he finds it uncomfortable. And when Bagpuss wakes up, all his friends wake up too. The mice on the mouse organ woke up and stretched. Who invented the mouse you, organ? You did. Did I, yes. really? I yeah. never think you are a corny joke, a mouse organ. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're lovely to animate because they had a, just had a single spike at the bottom, so they, you spike them into the ground and you move them and spike them somewhere else. Oh, fiddlesticks and flapdoodle. How many people could live in a little pink shoe like that? In the telling of the stories, we needed someone who could bring along some information. Oh, very well. So that's where we came up with... Professor Yaffle. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, Yaffle yeah, yeah. is the common name of the green woodpecker. He is the reincarnation of two persons from my youth. One is my uncle Douglas, G.D.H. Cole, who was a uh, Shichely professor of uh, eco economics and history at Oxford University, who was a dry old stick, and also a rather well-known philosopher, Bertrand Russell, whom I knew when I was young. And they both had this rather strange, rather thin voice. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, oh, stop, 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 stop. This is getting very silly. His great virtue is that he knows everything, so the mice send him up rotten, which is an ideal situation. Each week, Bagpuss and his friends came across an everyday object and tried to make sense of it. Each Bagpuss story is centred on the object, and that's a marvellous trigger. It's made of straw, it's very catty, and it hasn't any ears. I'm not surprised it looks sad. Yes, it does look sad. Poor old thing. I find something in the play box. It might be a pink elephant without any ears, and I'd dump it down in front of Peter and say, this is, this is for Bagpuss. And we would look at it balefully and try and think why it hasn't got any ears, you know, and... Uh, gradually a story would come out of it and that's so much better than a blank piece of paper because there's a thing there and the thing has already has characteristics. Their inspiration came from beyond the toy box. I went to Tunbridge Museum where they had a marvellous children's section and they had a Victorian mill which opened up. And really that was the beginning of the story of um, yep. the chocolate biscuit mill. That's right. Mmm, chocolate biscuits. Mmm, real chocolate biscuits. It made it made a, a good little magazine program in a sense. You know, we, 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 as a, you know, it had the cartoons, it had a, it had the stories, and it had all sorts of stuff in it. And it, it has a beginning rich. and an end, a middle and an end, so that at yeah. the end, the toy was taken into the window. And if if a one-legged ballerina should come past from one to left ballerina shoe, she would see it and come in to collect it. Recently, Bagpuss topped the vote in a BBC poll to find the most popular children's programme of all time. 
His victory testifies to this shabby feline's enduring appeal. People said to me, what is animation? I say, it's an extension of a pen. It's what you do in it, not how you do it, that matters. And I think that was the key to the, to the fact that our stuff got remembered. People remember what they saw, not how, you know, and that, that, that's why I got away with such bad animation, because people were looking at the what and not the how. We love to boogie. By setting Bagpuss in the Edwardian era, Postgate gave children an escape from the anxieties of life in the mid-1970s. What are you all standing there for? Mice, not work. Mice, strike. Oh, indeed. I was in a right state about the, the winter of discontent and the, the heath and the miners and politics. The, the government was being subverted by politics. And I said, look, can I make an election clangers on the folly of politics. So I, I went away and in three days I made vo vote for Froglet. And they showed it, they showed it two or three times. Look, suppose you wanted to have a government, uh, you could choose uh, the government of the soup dragon, for instance. <laughs> this was just part of uh, my inconvenient political concerns at the time. Party politics is a question of power. And, uh, hey, are you listening to me? <laughs> Postgate's election broadcast didn't resolve Britain's political instability, but it showed the BBC...